Good morning, everybody. We want to welcome you to First Christian Church. We are glad that you're here on this freezing cold day. So let's stand up. Let's get our hands clapping. Let's get us moving, and that'll help warm us up, won't it? <laughs> let's stand joined with us. Do you see what I see? Once again, good morning. 
that warmed me up. I hope, hopefully it warmed you up. It's nice and warm in here now. Um, hopefully you pulled or grabbed a bulletin as you came in this morning. There's a lot of information on there. Um, first of all, we want to remind the board, the, there's a board meeting right after church today. Um, and then the elders will meet at 1.30 after that. Um, this week is Jasmine's birthday. So when you see her during greeting, please give her a hug. Who? And Jenna's, and Jenna's, yes, and Jenna's. Is there anybody else I'm missing who has a birthday this week? Speak, speak up. All right, so Jasmine and Jenna, be sure and give them a hug uh, for their birthday this week. Um, a lot of prayer needs, prayer requests, so be sure and check those out. Um, keep it with you throughout the week. Also, we have the CIY fundraiser dinner uh, coming. We have the reservation little tickets back on the table. You'll see the little valentine looking table. You'll notice on the tickets, it's the same on both sides. Please fold those out. Tear it in half. It's not perforated, but tear it in half. Put one of those in the jar that's back there so that we know how many to plan for children, for the child care and food and all of that. Um, and then keep the other one for yourself just to have all the information with you. Um, I Oh, no, no, I've got two others here. Um, Fellowship Nights, enjoy a free dinner, a Frito pie and a potato bar with various desserts at Bethel Friends. Saturday, January 20th from 6.30 to 8. So if you don't have anything going on that evening, head on over there and have some fun with some games and food. Also on January 20th, it's a popular day, is the identity um, will be held at Assembly of God. Let me see here. Um, they're going to have light snacks. It's from 6 o'clock to 8 o'clock. Do they have to pre-register? I'm trying to look real quickly. I, I'm not seeing that on here. Just go. No? Okay. So it's an identity um, program, seminar. I'm at a loss for words right now. But anyway, it's at Assembly of God on January 20th from 6 to 8. So we don't think you have to pre-register. And I'm sure even if you did, they would love to have you come even if you don't register. So is that everything? Did I miss any announcements? Does anybody? Who? Okay. Is there any update on her? Okay. Okay. So keep Emily Peterson in our prayers. I know our family's been praying for her as well. She's still in Wichita, though. So hopefully it looks, sounds like maybe um, they're going to be s slowing that down. Anyway, so just um, pray for her recovery um, continued because she's still in the hospital. So thank you for sharing that. So anyway, all right. If there's no other um, announcements, let's just take this time to stand and greet each other, look for new faces, and just uh, take this time to say hello to everybody and let them know we're glad to have them here at First Christian.
They sing praise to you. They sing praise to your name. What a mighty God we serve as we praise him this morning. He is the God above all gods, the king above all kings, the God who is famous for all the things he's done since the beginning of creation to all the things he will do to the end. That's the God we serve. Would you continue to worship with us? no fear cause I believe there is no doubt cause I
Last week, it was so much fun to watch Beth and Casey bring their new baby to church for the first time, little Wrigley. And what was more fun is to watch how the whole congregation just kind of gathered right in this little area because everybody wanted to see the new baby. And I got to thinking about that this week, and I thought, you know, there's something about new that we like, whether it's new life a new car. I remember my dad, every time they would get a new car, he'd get in there and go, oh, I love the smell of a new car. Maybe it's a new haircut. Maybe it's a new home. Maybe it's a new athletic season. Maybe it's a new year like we just celebrated. There's something that we like about new. But as I thought about that too, church, there's something that we have that's very special to us as God's children. We have a new mercy every single day. And if you really think about all those things I just talked about, that is the most special, that God would give us a new mercy every time we fall before him and confess that we are sinners and we mess up every single day. And morning by morning, he gives us new mercies. That's something that's kind of foreign to us as humans because sometimes we like to hold on to things and not give that forgiveness or not give that forgetting that God gives to us. And so I just want to challenge you as we begin this new year to remember what Christ does for us every single day and remember his faithfulness is something that we really don't understand but we need to model after. 
He forgave us, so we should forgive others and be so grateful for that new mercy that he gives us each and every day. faithfulness. Like I said earlier, from the beginning of creation, you have, we were faithful then, you are faithful now, and you will be faithful to the very end. And we just want to thank you for that, Lord. Father, I just, um, we thank you for your life while you lived here on earth. We thank you for the blood that you shed for us because we know what that means. Without that, we would have no hope for eternity. But because of that, and because of your death and resurrection, we do have that promise to be with you forever and ever. And Father, right now, I just pray that you would place on our hearts in this new year to not get to the end of the year and say, how many lives did you use me to bring to you? And the answer be zero. Father, just impress on each one of our hearts this year in 2024 that that's more important than anything else we do, 
anything in our job, anything with our family, anything with the fun that we have, it is most important, Father, that we tell people about the information that we know. And that's your love and what you did for us, Father. Prepare our hearts right now to be as one with you in Christ's name. was a wretch I remember who I was I was lost I was blind I was running out of time sin separated the breach was far too wide from the far side So you made a way across the great divide, left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside. And there at the cross, you paid the debt I owed, broke my chains free. For the first time I had hope Thank you, Jesus, for the blood of mine Thank you, Jesus, it has washed me white Thank you, Jesus, you have saved
A certain pastor had memorized his liturgy, which he said three times a day, every day of the year. Because he had done this for many years, he knew the lines like his own name. One day he started his ritual and suddenly his mind went blank. He could not think of the first word. He could not remember any of the words. Embarrassed, he reached for his guidebook and read his lines aloud. Later in the day, he wondered, what went wrong? I've said those lines maybe 5,000 times. How could I suddenly forget them? As he thought about it, he began to realize every time he said his lines, he grew more and more weary of them until finally he had lost all motivation to say them. At this point, his mind rebelled and refused even to let him remember the words. Doing the same thing over and over can get boring, or it can stay interesting, depending upon our motivation. Some people think having the Lord's Supper every week gets tiresome, but it doesn't have to be. Americans eat about six times a day counting snacks, but seldom tire of good food. We sleep several hours every night, but a soft bed is always welcome. We drive our cars every day, but we are usually eager to go somewhere. It's not repetition alone that makes something boring, but rather our failure to remember our motivation and our failure to pay attention to what we are doing. If the Lord's Supper has become old stuff, perhaps I need to go back and read again the happy time of Christmas, the intriguing story of the life of Christ the thrilling account of the resurrection. If the Lord's Supper is tiresome, perhaps it's because I am tired. I need to go to bed earlier on Saturday night so I will be refreshed and able to concentrate on this ceremony. If the Lord's Supper seems uninteresting, I need to remember the dark and tangled web of sins Jesus took away when he stretched out his hands across the out his hands on the cross there is nothing boring about forgiveness galatians 6:9 and let us not get tired of doing what is right for after a while we will reap the harvest of blessings if we don't get discouraged and give up. Our gracious Heavenly Father, 
we thank you so very much for this ceremony that you have presented us with. The broken body, the shed blood to save us of our sins. Let us not forget that sacrifice. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. Good morning. Today's offering meditation is entitled, A Heart Mood Contribution. In Exodus 25, 2, God instructs Moses to speak to the people of Israel, inviting them to bring a contribution for him. However, there's a beautiful and significant condition attached to this act of giving. And it says in Exodus 25, 2, from every man whose heart moves him, you shall receive the contribution for me. This verse captures the essence of true giving, a giving that is motivated by a heart stirred with love and devotion. It's not about compulsion or obligation, but about a genuine response to God's leading. When we give with a heart that is moved, something extraordinary happens. Our giving becomes an expression of our love for God, a tangible way to worship and honor Him. It becomes an opportunity to align our desires with his and to participate in his purpose. God doesn't need our contributions. He desires our hearts. He longs for our willingness to respond to his leading, to generously give from the depths of our being. So as we prepare to give today, let us examine our hearts. Let us ask God to move us, to stir within us a genuine desire to contribute to response to his leading, and surrender our resources to his purposes. Let's bow a word of prayer, please. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that you provided for us. We ask you to bless the offering this morning, as well as the giver, and may the proceeds help support the ministry here at First Christian Church, as well as the missions that are near and afar. In the name of Jesus Christ, we do pray this. Amen.
kids are dismissed for Children's Church and Little Explorers. During Christmas, there was this gift bag left on Jillian's desk, and it had my name on it. And when I got to opening it up, uh, I smiled, but I also, you know, kind of think, I don't know if I really, truly appreciate this gift because it's a warning to all of you people. It's this T-shirt. It says, Pastor, warning, anything you say or do can be used in a sermon. And I was told that by that, that Jillian said, Phil wants you to wear that to church because I think Phil must be tired of people walking into my sermons and not even realizing that they're someday going to be in it. But uh, anyway, ignore the shirt and keep doing things that I can put in, in into sermons because that, that just helps make my day. Uh, I just want to say thanks, Renee, uh, for the songs that you picked out today. Uh, just really encouraging. I mean, we need to be reminded of God's faithfulness each and every day and what he, had, he what Jesus has done for us. I mean, think about it. He is faithful. He gives us hope. He gives us peace. He gives us forgiveness. We don't deserve it. What we deserve is to be left out there in the cold. I don't want to be out there in the cold at all because it's too cold. In fact, when I came this morning about 5 o'clock, it was minus 2. I didn't envy any of the players or the fans in Kansas City yesterday or last night. I just thought, man, I hope I have enough sense not to ever go to a game that cold. But I'm sure they enjoyed it. They had a time of their life. And for many of them, it was a once-in-a-lifetime thing. But I'm just thankful that God is faithful. He gave us this building the, the furnaces were working today so we can be warm. And Carrie, I want to say thanks too for that meditation. We so often come here because it's just a, something we check off the box. And we don't remember why we come. We're not here for ourselves. We're here because of who God is and what he has done for us. And because of that, we come and we can get a whole lot out of it. A lot more than we deserve. Don't forget that. Hopefully you remember that each and every day. Uh, before we start, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you uh, for t today. Even though it is extremely cold, there is a reason for this cold, even though I may, though I may not know why or understand. But I trust you that this needs to be. And Father, I pray that you help us to remember that however the weather is, whatever's going on in life, that you are faithful, that we can trust you, we can lean on you and rely on you because you are always faithful and always good. Father, as we open up our Bibles, Father, I pray that you speak to us. Father, help us to hear your words. Father, I pray that our ears are open, our eyes are open, our minds are open, and our hearts are open to hear your truth. So we can take it from our heads to our, to our hearts to our hands. So we can be salt and light to this world. So that others can feel your warmth, feel your love your forgiveness, your peace, your hope. In your son's name we pray. Amen. A high school student was applying for college, and as she filled out her application, she came across a question that just really made her heart sink. The question was, do you see yourself as a leader or as a follower? Even though she wanted to write leader, uh, honesty got the better of her, and she wrote a follower. She sent in her application expecting the worst, and to her surprise, she received an acceptance letter from the college. 
And attached to, included in the, the, the acceptance letter was a note saying this. It appears that this year our college will have 1,452 new leaders. We are accepting you because we feel it is imperative that they have at least one follower. The truth is everyone, all of us, are following something or someone. Some people follow in the footsteps of their family. Some follow a philosophy of life like the golden rule. Others follow their own intuition, drawing from a buffet table of philosophy, religion, friends, or family. Basically, they do whatever they, they think or they feel is right in their gut. So this, this morning, I have a question for you. What about you? What or who do you follow? As Christians, we are by definition followers of Christ. Unfortunately, many churchgoers today are more like fans than followers. Now, we may wear a cross necklace, but we don't bear the cross. You May uh, some go to church and know all the songs, open their their Bibles and take notes. They they can walk to their car after church, and their car has a, a a Jesus fish bumper sticker on the bumper. You may even say grace before all your meals, but the thing is that doesn't necessarily make us a follower of Christ. In Jewish culture, whenever a young aspiring disciple set off to follow his chosen rabbi, the family would offer a traditional blessing, that, and, and this is what they would say. May you be covered in the dust of your rabbi. Let me say that again. May you, be, follow, in the, may you follow in the, and be covered in the dust of your rabbi. In other words, what they're saying, may you follow in the footsteps of your rabbi so closely that you are covered in the sand kicked up by his sandals. That's exactly what Jesus calls us to do. To follow in his footsteps. To teach what he has taught. And to do what he did. Now, I know, obviously, Jesus isn't standing physically right here in front of us. We can't physically follow him the way that his early disciples did. That's why Peter explains in 1 Peter chapter 2, uh, verse 21, he, Peter says, For God called you to do good, even if it means suffering, just as Christ suffered for you. He is your example, and you must follow in his footsteps. That's why God gave us the scriptures. That's why God gave us the, the gospels, the good news, so we could read them, we could study them, we could discover how Jesus lived and how he loved people. In order to, for us to uh, follow Jesus more closely, it is imperative that we see him more clearly. That we enlarge our vision of who Jesus is and how he lived. And so for the next 16 weeks, we are going to follow Jesus chapter by chapter through the gospel of Mark. Now honestly, we could have a whole lot more sermons than just 16. We're going to break this down just to 16 sermons. In fact, Mark is, at, at Mark is 16 chapters long, and it is the shortest of the four Gospels. It's also the first, first one that was wrote. It was written around 45 A.D. It was written by John Mark, the nephew of Barnabas. Mark traveled with his uncle Barnabas and the apostle Peter on early missionary journeys. He even traveled some with Paul. Now, as Mark traveled with Peter, he listened to Peter preach about Jesus in the towns that they went, and he wrote down what he could and everything he learned from Peter in a fast-paced story type way. So we are going to take a look 
how Jesus lived, how he loved, and how we can follow in his footsteps. So if you have your Bible this morning, you have your phone or your iPad, and you have the Bible app on it, I want to encourage you to open it up to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1 starts off with these words. This is the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. He gives us a warning. He says, this is good news. This is news that, that Mark could not keep to himself. When it comes to Jesus, we need to understand that we can't we shouldn't be able to keep this in. We should want to share it. Like any good story, anything uh, amazing that happens to us, we've got, we should be wanting to share it. And this is what Mark is going to do. In fact, from here, Mark offers a threefold introduction to Jesus. First, the anticipation of Jesus. Now, the Old Testament was filled with prophecies about the coming of the Messiah, the Christ, the, the birth of, of the Messiah. Isaiah wrote about it. Micah spoke of it. Even Abraham looked forward to this day, as did his son Isaac and Jacob and Moses and even King David. They all saw that this, that this day was coming. The thing is, they just didn't know exactly when it would happen. It was as if the prophets uh, provided an advent calendar with no numbers. All these prophecies built anticipation and expectation for the coming of the Messiah. No prophets wrote in more detail about the Messiah than the prophet Isaiah. In fact, Mark begins by pointing out the fulfillment of one of Isaiah's prophecies here in verses 2 and 3. So let's read that. In fact, if you want to get technical, as you see on uh, it, it ends with the last part of verse 1 and then verse 2. So it began is in verse 1. And 2 starts, just as the prophet Isaiah had written, Look, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, and he will prepare your way. He is a voice shouting in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord's coming. Clear the road for him. Now, seven centuries earlier, the prophet Isaiah predicted that a forerunner shouting in the wilderness would prepare the way for the Lord's coming. And then at the time in Jewish history when anticipation for the Messiah had a, a, a Messiah's arrival reached a, a fever pitch, God sent John, we know him as John the Baptist, a, a simple man dressed in camel's hair to prepare the, God's people for the coming of the Messiah, who would be, as we know, as Jesus. In those days, an announcer or a herald always preceded an important Roman officials. And when the uh, herald would arrive, uh, the, the people knew that someone of prominence would soon arrive. And that's what John did for Jesus. His call to clear the road for him meant urging people to give up their selfish way of living, renouncing their sins, seek God's forgiveness, and establish a new relationship with God through faith and obedience. John prepared people by calling them to confess their sins, repent, and to be baptized. The Jews often baptized non-Jews who converted to Judaism. But John took this existing custom and gave it new meaning. Baptism became a visible sign of repentance and renewal, preparing people's hearts to receive their Savior. Now, people who don't know Jesus need to prepare to meet Him. Like John, we as Christians can prepare the way by explaining their need for forgiveness. The, the forgiveness of, of their sins. We need to be demonstrating Christ's teaching in our own lives and telling them how Jesus can give their lives meaning. Again, I think it's important that those who truly have an encounter with Jesus, we're just going to let people know. We're going to share the good news of Jesus. In fact, it's better news 
than winning the lottery, even if it's a billion dollars. Christians can clear the road for Him, Jesus, by removing barriers and correcting misconceptions that might prevent someone from approaching Jesus. I mean, how many times have we heard, uh, uh, Jesus won't want me. I can't go to Jesus because you just don't know or He doesn't know what I have done. I'm too bad. I'm long gone. I ha- there is no hope for me. That's a misconception. That means that Jesus can't forgive all sins. We know the truth that Jesus can forgive all sins. We never know who, when someone will be ready to ha- start a relationship with Jesus. They are just waiting on us to share the good news with them. And like John, we can help prepare the way for the Lord's coming. But more importantly... If you haven't already, you need to prepare your own heart to receive in Jesus. Are you preparing yourself for that encounter with Jesus? Second, we have the announcement of Jesus. Now, John is a charismatic and dynamic man of God that many people began to wonder if John himself was the promised Messiah. But to set the, uh, so John had to set the, the record straight, and he announced in verses 7 and 8 of our text, this is what, what John, uh, John uh, said, Someone is coming s- soon who is greater than I am, so much greater that I am not even worthy to stoop down like a slave and untie the straps of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. When John finally announces the coming of Jesus, he highlights two dimensions of the Messiah, his worth and his work. John sums up Jesus' worth in one word, greater. Jesus, the Messiah, is greater than I am. In fact, he's so much greater than I am, I'm not even worthy to lace up his sandals. Boxing legend Muhammad Ali often boldly declared, I am the greatest. On one occasion, Ali had, was flying to a fight and he refused to buckle his seatbelt. And the flight attendant was insisting that Ali buckle up. And Ali said to him, Superman don't need no seatbelt. And the attendant replied, Superman don't need no plane either, so buckle up. That was a good comeback. Muhammad Ali may have been a great boxer, but compared to Jesus, Ali isn't even worth, he's not worthy to lace up Jesus' boxing gloves. We have songs that we can sing with the artists like Chris Tomlin's song where his words go, Our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God. If we would just sit and think about the greatness of God, we'd realize that we aren't even worthy to be here this morning. We wouldn't even be worthy to speak his name. But he wants us to. He wants us to think about his greatness. If we think about it, Jesus is greater than any other. The greatest event in human history was the coming of Jesus into this world. The greatest words ever spoken were his, Jesus' words. The greatest deeds ever done were accomplished by Jesus' hands. And the greatest gift ever offered was Jesus' blood at Calvary. Jesus alone. Jesus stands alone in history as the single greatest person who has ever lived. 
And in addition to, his, to the worth of Jesus, John also announced the work of Jesus. He said that Jesus would baptize people not with water, but with the Holy Spirit. Jesus would immerse believers in the Holy Spirit, sending the Spirit to live within each one of us. Now, John's baptism uh, was water baptism. It prepares a person's heart to receive Jesus, who then pours out his Spirit to us. Through his Spirit, Jesus offers us both forgiveness of sin and the power to live in him, for him. Jesus still offers his Holy Spirit to those who are in faith, uh, who have a faith in him. In fact, years later, the apostle Peter would answer a, a question on the, the day of Pentecost when he was asked, what must we do to be saved? In Acts 2, 38 and 39, Peter uh, re- gives them the answer. He says, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized, immersed in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you to your children, and to those far away, all who have been called by the Lord our God. His worth is greater than any of the words that we could possibly come up to express His worth. And Jesus' work is life-changing. When somebody has a true encounter with Jesus, their life is changed forever. Third, the anointing of Jesus. After months of ministry along the Jordan River, John the Baptist finally came face to face with the Messiah that he anticipated and that he had announced. Mark writes in verses 9 through 11 of our text, One day, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee, and John baptized him in the Jordan River. As Jesus came up out of the water, he saw the heavens splitting apart and the Holy Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice from heaven said, You are my dearly loved Son, and you bring me great joy. Can you picture that? Can you picture Jesus stepping down into the, the, the Jordan River, the, which was the lifeblood of his people? Jesus wading through the muddy water and the water uh, churning around him and going by him and, and the, the cool mud squishing up between his toes with each step that he took. And what an awe-inspiring sight this might have been if we were there to, uh, to, to witness it. And, and it was also a little confusing, especially for John. Jesus' baptism is one of the most significant moments in history. Any attempt to unravel its mystery and majesty uh, 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 ought to be seen for what it is. It, it was a human perception of a heavenly event. And I don't know about you, but when I read this, we, we, there, there, there's, there's questions that we we'll often ask or we should be asking. See, John preached a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. But Jesus had no sins. He was sinless, spotless. He was perfect. But as Jesus descended into the water, he came down to our level. Through his baptism, Jesus identified himself with you and me. Baptism was for the immoral, the impure, the liars, the adulterers, the thieves. Let's just put it this way, for the sinners, which is all of us. Yet Jesus willingly plunged into the water as if to say, I'm with them. He came to the river because we are sinners. He was washed because we were not clean. He did what was right because we so often do what is wrong. He became like us so that way we could become like him. By allowing John to baptize him, Jesus showed support for John's ministry and for the message that he was given out. Jesus identified with humanness and sin and gave us an example to follow. But as mysterious and intriguing as Jesus' baptism was, what happened next is simply mind-blowing. 
picture that scene. Jesus is there in the water. He's been baptized. And then as if the sky was, was a curtain, the heavens parts and the river of light tumbles onto the earth. And the crowd, the crowd came to see a wide-eyed and crazy-dressed preacher from the desert. But what they saw, they had never seen before. What they heard was something they had never heard before. The Holy Spirit, the breath of God, who hovered above the waters at the beginning of creation, drifts down from heaven like a dove, falling upon Jesus. And just then the voice of God, the same voice that called into the, into the endless darkness at the, at the creation of, uh, of the world, he said, let there be light. This voice echoed through the wilderness, possibly like a proud papa. They heard God say, you are my dearly loved son, and you bring me great joy. Jesus heard the words that every kid wants to hear from their dad. You are my, my son. You are my daughter. I love you, and you bring me great joy. You see, all three persons of the Trinity here, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, converge at this moment in this place. You see, this is the anointing of Jesus. The Father encourages Jesus. The Spirit empowers Jesus. This anointing marked the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. His mission was to save the world. And from this day forward, nothing would ever be the same. Just imagine standing at the river's edge that day, witnessing the magnificence of this moment. Before you stands a, a figure sopping wet with loose strands of hair plastered to his face, yet so consuming that you know, instantly you know that nothing else matters. Forget the stock markets. School reports, sales meetings, last night's football game, today's football games, Mondays of the playoffs, whatever sport you're into, whatever you're into, it doesn't matter. Nothing is newsworthy. All that matters, that used to matter, and matters no more. For Christ has come, and that's what matters. This is the Jesus that we are called to follow. With an introduction like that, especially if you were there, how could you not follow him? We read about him in, 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 in the Gospels. How could we not want to follow him? So I ask you, what about you? Have you felt the anticipation of Jesus? Have you prepared the way or cleared the road for Jesus to come into somebody else's life? Have you believed the announcement of Jesus? Do you recognize His greatness? Have you embraced His Spirit? Have you joined Jesus in the waters of baptism? See, our journey to follow Jesus begins at the river's edge. If you haven't already, I want to invite you to walk down to the river's edge, to remove your sandals, to let the water fill in behind as you take a step into the water, and to be immersed into Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and for the gift of the Holy Spirit. To take that step, to follow Jesus, to commit your life to following Him, to following Him so closely that hopefully, the sands that his sandals pick up will fall on you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for being our God. We thank you for Jesus. He was the long-awaited Messiah that the Jews were waiting for. That for many Jews, they're still waiting for the Messiah. They just totally missed that Jesus was the Messiah. They totally missed what your prophets had prophesied about. And Father, I thank you that you have opened our eyes so we can see that Jesus is the Messiah. 
that you declared through Isaiah and the other prophets that was to come, that Jesus is your son. He is the Savior of the world. And Father, I pray that we don't take for granted the message that we get to read in your word. But Father, I pray that we, that our hearts desires to follow you, to take in the, good, the gospel of Jesus, the good news of Jesus, and to put it in our hearts and to live it out each day the way you want us to live it out, the way Jesus lived it out when he was here on earth, so that people can see you in us. And that others will see you and want to come and embrace and have that encounter with Jesus. Because nothing else in this world matters but Jesus. And if we don't have Jesus, we've missed it all. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Well, let's stand as we sing. <laughs>
four friends bringing a friend who was paralyzed to Jesus for an encounter. I'm looking forward to sharing that with you next week. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for Jesus. Your word says that he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to you except through him. Because Jesus is life. And Father, I pray that we remember that. That when we are in Jesus, we have life. We have the way to you. We have answers to life. We have purpose. We have mission. We have a reason for living because of you. And Father, I pray that we live our lives according to that. That we just desire to be with you and to share you with those that are around us. In your son's name we pray. Amen.